Well, listen, let's get started. I'm Lynn Miller Pease. Um, I'm with Leadership Everyone. And before we get into um, our wonderful speaker and content, um, I want to ask everyone if you have not, and of course, I know which one of you has and has not <laughs> um, done their nominations for Celebration of Leadership. Really, we would love to have those. Um, we'll have our event in March this year. Um, so we really need to get them in and get them processed. So you can go on leadershipeveryone.org, go to Celebration of Leadership, click on that nomination, fill it out, send it in. And then what will happen is that Denise and Elizabeth and I um, will get up off your ass. How's that? Okay, I said it. Otherwise, we're going to keep bothering you. Like, could we do anything without me saying ass? I don't think so. I just, I just think it's not possible. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is go to um, communityvoice.com. Did I say it right? Dot org or dot com? Okay. Voicecommunity.org. I'll have Elizabeth put stuff up there. And we want you to do the visioning online experience that and then we would love it if you would if you would send it to other people organizations groups um voicecommunity.org um because we want to get as many people engaged in visioning as we can because it's going to make it richer uh, more interesting and, and it's fun it's fun to do and it's fun to share mm -hmm. um okay those are my two big announcements denise elizabeth did i forget anything else February class, if you've got people that you want in the February class, it's getting kind of full. It is. So, um, yeah, join just as quick as you can, and please tell people that we, we want them to come, and we have a really safe way to do it. It, it, it turned out really good mm -hmm. in August, didn't it, Denise? It did, and Rita's here. She can t attest. Rita to can tell you. Rita yeah. can tell you. Lee's here. Um, say, yeah. yeah, see, we've got, we've got witnesses. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, we, we are so excited because we have Holly Rankin there, Reverend, no, is it Reverend or, heck, I want to say goddess. Yeah. <laughs> Reverend Holly Rankin. Goddess work. Many, many um, women in my daughter should do go by mother, mother, like mother Holly, but, uh, Holly works for me. Holly's is Holly good? Holly's Because I can say it, I can spell it, I'm really in with that. <laughs> Um, Holly is an Ellie alum. She's on our board of directors. And I'm telling you what, from the moment she's got involved in the retreat and beyond and then the board, she has just jumped in with both feet. And she has some wonderful wisdom and facilitation to share with us. And I, I believe we're going to talk about how to deal with what's coming up with the holidays, a number of us have kind of noticed that we, we kind of thought that, I don't know, by now we would see at least where COVID would end and wouldn't the holidays be joyous. And all of a sudden we're realizing that we're going to have to make a lot of adjustments yeah. and a lot of change. And it's, it's kind of unsettling. So um, even in all my energy, I had to, I had to own to some like mild depression. Like I want to take a nap, stuff like that. I'm like, what, what's going on? Who am I? So Holly has agreed to come on and share um, some of her philosophy and some of the, the things that she knows that we can do about this situation. And anytime we're really in grief or in any kind of, of things like that, is that, is that cool? Holly, did I do a good enough job? You did a great job, Lynn. That was fantastic. Thank you. And Thank she's you. just yeah. fabulous. You guys are in for a treat. We <laughs> just love her. And um, you should go visit her, her church once it becomes able to be visited because it's really got a beautiful feel to it. It's, it's beautiful. Just very we are worshiping, we're worshiping in our courtyard at 8 in the morning, which has been really fun. Um, and we're worshiping online still. But yeah, it's... Love to have you anytime. You're always welcome. Very good. Yeah. Um, tell everybody your address. It's Episcopal. I know that. It's St. Paul's Episcopal Church, 301 Southeast 1st Street. And so um, it's a little confusing because I think there's three St. Paul's, St. Paul's churches in the city or in this area. Uh, so it is St. Paul's Episcopal. So if you're looking for 
We're the only Episcopal church. Uh, so if you're looking for us, that's one of the ways you can find us. Awesome. So here is Holly. Go. Go. On your market set. Go. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to offer five different strategies for making our way through the end of 2020. Um, they are not the only strategies out there. They are strategies that I found helpful. And what I'd like us to do as a learning community today is to figure out some ways that we might be able to embody these strategies in our own world. And so we're going to develop kind of a play on ourselves of how we might be able to navigate this situation. But before we do, you know, it's LE, so we have to do some kind of gathering thing, right? So we want to know who's in the room. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to show you two short videos. I'm not going to show you the, the complete one of either one of them. I want you to think about, reflect on which of these uh, videos describes you best as you prepare for the holidays. So which of these videos describes you best? So after we watch both of them, I will share and then I'll ask someone else to tell us which of these videos describes them best as we prepare for the holidays, whatever they look like. You may have seen this first one. It came out a few years ago, but it's just worth watching a little bit of it. That's for sure. In the house now, now, now people. I want this place looking like Disney on ice in one minute. Harry, if you haven't made your bed, throw it away. It's too late to make it now. Company is coming. Get rid of the couches. We can't let people know we sit. The chairs need to be pushed in. There cannot be any sign of living in this house. I don't care if we have to throw everything out. I want this place looking like a new Mediterranean fusion restaurant by noon. <laughs> ah! <laughs> So that's company is coming. Is that how you are when it comes to uh, to life getting ready for uh, the holidays? Or are you this? Can you see the aquarium up now? Are people seeing the aquarium? Okay. Is this who you are? I think I personally needed some type of like Zen after that intense um, first video. So I will admit that I can become scary mommy. I have three kids pretty quickly. And so, you know, obviously these are extremes. So maybe a little bit, a little bit in from that extreme at times. Uh, so I'm Holly and I'm more of the companies coming. So uh, Perry, what about you? I'm Perry and I'm definitely company is coming, although I'm seeking to be Zen. Could you pick someone else for us, Perry? Uh, sure. How about Don? I would say if it's my house, I'm more of the company's company. But if I'm helping someone else, I'm more of just the floating Zen. Good, good indication. Who's next, Don? Let's go with Brian. Probably more of the Zen. I rarely get as like worked up as the first one, especially because he looked like a woman, but I know that was a man. <laughs> okay, who's uh, next, Brian? Uh, Tasha. Uh, this is Tasha. I would say I'm definitely more jellyfish, but, um, well, definitely jellyfish. And if my mom asks me to go shopping, I would still say jellyfish and also ready to sting when people <laughs> are crazy. So definitely jellyfish. Who's next, Tasha? Thank you. Um, Autumn. Hello, I'm Autumn and I'm more jellyfish. 
Who's next, Autumn? Um, hold on, I'm on my phone. I'm looking, I'm looking. Hey, Chris. Hey, learning partner. Hey, LP. <laughs> this is Chris Metz. I would say um, I get to be the jellyfish, but that's only because my wife is a saint and she is company's coming. So because she takes that role, I get to be the jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Good reflection. Who's next, Chris? Let's go with Lorian. Okay, so I'm going to argue that there is a third type because I am not nearly as zen as the jellyfish because I'm stressed out thinking I should be type one, but I really don't have the energy to do any of the cleaning. Yes. I like it. Lauren, who's next? Okay, let me see who is in. The not on. Amy? So Amy. Okay. Sorry, I was on late, but I don't know what a jellyfish represents. <laughs> so when you are ready, getting ready for company, like on a holiday, are you really intense? We got to clean everything. Or are you kind of laid back? Let things happen. Um, I'm really intense. Okay. <laughs> Thank so you. which one am I? So that would be, there was a video called Companies Coming where somebody was uh, running through the house saying, we can't make it look like we live here. And yeah. I've seen that before. I know. It's a good one. Yeah. So am I a jellyfish? No, you would be companies coming. Companies coming. Okay. Yeah. That's what I am. Thank you. Who's next, Amy? Uh, I have no idea who's gone. Um, well, did Elizabeth uh, go? Nope. Elizabeth hasn't gone yet. Um, I actually think I'm somewhere in the middle. Like, I think I tend to be so intense most of the time that by the time like company comes, I'm just like, okay, like if there's anything extra, I just like throw it in a closet, but like definitely do not get in my cooking area. Like do not even get within 10 feet of the cooking area Yeah, on any day of the week. <laughs> Good to know. Mental note. Who's next, Liz? Um, how about Kyle? Um, I want to say that I'm somewhere in between, but I'm probably more like companies coming, but on the outside, the jellyfish <laughs> posing as a jellyfish. I will have to, I do have to say that I grew up, my grandmother still to this day, she has a central vacuum in her home and every morning she'll get ready in the back of the house. And as she makes her way to the front of the house, she'll take just the head of the central vacuum. She won't plug it in, but she'll make rows in the carpet to make it look like it's just vacuumed. So. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Kyle, who's next? Um, Rita, have you gone? I have not. Um, I'm gonna be in the middle. I'm gonna be in the middle as well. Um, it depends on who's coming. Um, if the parents or in-laws are coming, I'm definitely the jellyfish because um, they're going to claim when they get here anyway. Um, and <laughs> if it's just, you know, um, if it's some strangers or I'm actually, you know, trying to act like I have good sense, it's going to be the company's <laughs> coming. Yeah. For Lynn, I would do the good cleaning. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. Has Luke gone? No. Let's go look. I have not. Overall, I'd say I have a mix of the two, but if I had to pick one, uh, surprisingly, when it comes to company, I think I would be more of the company if it's coming. Uh, I say look because I'm definitely an over-preparer, and it's almost a detriment because then we end up with far too much stuff, and then my wife is like, what, what, what are we doing here? You know, we're feeding three people, not an army, so. Uh, I think... Uh, has Andrew gone? I know he's driving. But. I don't think so. Andrew is not gone. I can go. Okay, great. Um, I am a jellyfish, and my wife is uh, the hurry up and clean everything. So by default, we are the hurry up and clean everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Who's next? Let's see. I have no idea. Sorry. Lynn and Denise and Beth and Lee have not gone. 
So why, Beth, why don't you go? Sure. Um, so I am hardcore companies coming. I've even uttered the words, we can't pretend like we've got to make it look like we don't live here. I've uttered those words oh. to children in the drill sergeant uh, tone. Um, so yeah, I'd love to say that I'm Zen and I'm Zen once they get here, yeah. but it is total companies coming before then. Um, Denise. Okay. Well, I would say companies coming, but it really does lean towards all the cleaning. I don't really like to cook. So my jellyfish husband does the cooking and I'm sweeping around him. How Thank about you. Jesse? As long as there's enough uh, beer in the fridge and wine available, I lean towards the jellyfish. <laughs> but if I know people are coming and we don't have enough of those supplies, I may freak out a little bit to go stock up. <laughs> Let's see. Jesse, who's, who's next? Uh, I think Lynn is, Lynn and then Olivia is connecting right now, but. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Lynn, you want to go next? Okay, now I am definitely companies coming. However, I would say that as time has gone on, since I don't have three kids living here, and I mean, it's just easier to be ready because I live by myself, so I can keep it a certain way. So going from like regular day and company, it's not as much of a stretch. In the past, though, it is like, I, I mean, I threatened my children because they, they, are, they are slobs. They are slobs and they're messy and so are the animals. And, um, you know, we gotta make it look good for our people who are coming. And I cook too much too, always. Olivia, so, I'm, I'm wondering if you wanna contribute. We were just talking about if we were more intense in getting ready cleaning etc before somebody comes over or if we are more zen like um and almost like we were i showed a, a video of an aquarium of jellyfish swimming so which one would be would describe you when you're getting ready for the holidays um probably cramming around trying to get stuff done yeah. before everybody gets here i'm pretty clean anyway but still you know you still can find something that needs to be cleaned up <laughs> Thank you. And Andrea, is that you too there? Yeah, hi. Um, hey, how are you? What I'm about good. you? Well, Andrea already mentioned what I am. I always have an organization project going on, which drives him crazy, um, especially if I move anything. Um, but once companies come in, all that organization, we got to get it all figured it out and, and, and companies coming, so get it all up. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Did, did everybody have a chance to go? Is there anyone else that needs to have a moment? Well, thank you for, um, for sharing who's in the room. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, I'm going to share an app called Padlet, which I've been using uh, to do something called compression planning. And compression planning is something that uh, was used to create some of the, uh, the, um, the way that Disneyland was laid out. It's some of the ways that people have uh, done some project management. It's the way that I've uh, organized events and like how, how I'm going to do my time uh, for really the past almost 25 years. So, uh, but I've been utilizing this particular uh, strategy online using Padlet lately. And I thought I would just use it as a tool to show us what we're going to talk about today. So usually in a compression planning session, we would do a lot of brainstorming and then we would really focus. So we're going to do just the brainstorming half. Um, if, if I was doing this with your company or with your organization, then we would take it and actually take it into an, an action plan. And you could take something like this and build it into an action plan too, uh, if it would be helpful. So I would say like our overall purpose at LE um, and with with uh, in, in the Evansville area um, is generally to live well and to help others in our area to live well. I mean, that's just, I just pulled it. It's not the mission statement, but it was uh, one way that we might describe how we're working together. And then the purpose of this session though, 
are to really describe what five specific strategies might look like as we seek to live well during this holiday season. So that's where we're gonna focus. We're gonna focus on the holiday season. Now with that, we have this background and our background for today's uh, conversation is that many of us have traditions and or rituals that we celebrate over the holiday season. Number two, this year due to the pandemic, job loss, economic crisis, racial unrest, we are unable to celebrate in the ways that we are used to. And number three is that we need to pay more attention to safety and keeping well than usual. So those are pieces of the background that are gonna influence the different strategies that we're talking about. So our non-purposes of the session are to grouse about our current situation because we really can't do anything about it. Do you need to grouse about, about it? Give me a call sometime, I'm happy to listen. I get it, man, this is, this is just nuts. You know, I had to cancel something else yesterday. You know, it was just, it's just that, that time that it's uh, frustrating to try to plan anything, anything, right? Uh, the second non-purpose is to eradicate the coronavirus. It'd be great if we could do that, but that's not what we're gathered. And we're also not here to debate the merits of Elf on the Shelf because I would win because I do not like Elf on the Shelf. But we're not here to debate the merits. Uh, you can put that in the comments uh, and tell me why I'm wrong, and that's fine as well. So the first strategy I thought that we would uh, lead we lead with is this whole strategy of being thankful. So Dr. Brene Brown, who is a social worker um, and who does a lot of organizational development work, her stuff is fantastic, um, a big, big BB fan, right? Uh, she, she did this research and what was so fascinating to her is that there's actually a correlation between joy and gratefulness. And what she thought, her initial assumption when she came into this, is that she thought, well, if you are joyful, you're going to be grateful. She thought that there is a correlation between having joy first and then becoming grateful. But what she found in her research, that it was actually the other way around, that grateful people, or that joyful people were actually grateful, that somehow gratefulness is what um, is the place where joy grows. And so if you want to be a joyful person, being grateful is a way to do that. Now, sometimes that's hard to get our mind wrapped around. I mean, we are in November, so everybody's doing, you know, gratefulness uh, ideas or gratefulness lists, gratitude lists. They're all good. That's what's amazing is just the act of being grateful starts to shift something. It's not a magic pill, but it, there is some significant work research that's been done that says that when you are grateful, you cultivate joy. And don't we all want joy, especially this holiday season when nothing seems to be normal or nothing seems to be quote unquote right. So let's go ahead and practice this. Let's go ahead in the chat, just offer one thing that you're grateful for. One thing, and if you use an F word, family, friends, or food, I don't know which one you were thinking, but if you use an F word there, make sure you're specific. Um, I think those are just, sometimes when we say our, we're grateful for our family or grateful for our friends, that's great, but why? What is it about your friends that you're really grateful for today? Are you grateful that they showed up at your door for, with dinner because you were exhausted? Are you grateful that someone sent you a postcard in the mail? What are you, are you grateful for a text that someone sent you. So let's take a moment and just in the chat offer something you're grateful for today. I see kittens from uh, Denise. I also see some Brene Brown love. A baby sleeping through the night. Yes. For good health. Fulfilling work. Ah, getting to spend all this time the last few months fully appreciating my parents, for dear friends, for peanut butter. Oh, peanut butter has got me through a lot. Grateful for friends to call on Zoom. Um, grateful for my home. Grateful for friends and family still willing to meet in person. Grateful my mother is doing well. Grateful for friends and family helps my mental health. The ability to continue providing a safe space for clients during the pandemic. Luke's wife's patience and all she does for her family. Lynn says recovery and spirituality. 
Beth is offering grateful for family who I could still see, even if it's socially distant. Amy, grateful for a healthy family and my chihuahua. I'm grateful today for music. Um, I have somebody who is, we have, we've been gifted, I think, six instruments in the last six months. Um, and I've been trying to learn how to play them all at the same time. It's not going so well, but I am having fun. Um, and there's a lot of joy. So gratefulness, that's the first strategy. Where else have you seen gratefulness? Where else have you, like how have you incorporated gratefulness in your own life or family? Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. So Holly, let me ask a clarification. So this is gratefulness that I've brought to others or help you clarify the question. Okay, thank you, thank you for that clarifying question. Um, just where have you, um, how have you practiced gratefulness yourself? The practice of gratefulness. Like, do you do a great, how do you keep a grateful journal? One of the things that my gotcha. family does gotcha. before uh, we eat together is we all say one thing that we're grateful for about the day. And so that just has become our, that's our tradition in our family. Does anyone else have a grateful practice or a way that you practice gratefulness? This is Chris Metz. I'll just share briefly that, you know, I, I turn to two things of which gratitude is one. If I'm feeling down or if I'm feeling troubled, I found that focusing on gratitude, number one, and focusing number two on empathy are two mm -hmm. things that can pull me out of a funk very, very quickly because when I'm in a funk, I'm probably just kind of in my own head. And, and gratitude forces me to think about the, the, the other people, the other things outside of myself that I'm grateful for. And empathy uh, really takes you again to a place of gratitude. So I find that those are two self-care exercises I use specifically when I need them, specifically I'm feeling down. Thank you, Chris, that's really helpful. Okay. Go ahead, Tasha. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily being grateful, but something that I me, mean, I think it kind of is practicing, practicing being grateful, uh, when things are kind of going wrong or somebody's talking about something and it just seems to be like bad after bad after bad, I try to kind of flip the conversation and say, you know, well, what went right or what was something good that came from that? Or, you know, like, you know, and just kind of, even if it's just, just trying to deflect or, you know, change, I don't know, the tone of the conversation. That's really great. How about one or two more people? Anything that you found helpful in terms of practicing gratefulness or gratitude? Holly, this is Beth. I, I think one of the things that we've done as a family is we don't turn on any electronics until after we've done all of our stuff. And what that's helped me be grateful for is that it's allowed us as a family to focus on each other mm. and what's important before we get distracted by the entire world. Thank you, Beth. That's, that's really helpful. That whole idea of setting boundaries and then gives you space to be grateful. Holly, I was thinking about staying in the moment. Mm, instead yep. of thinking about what might happen if you're worried about something or criticizing yourself from the past, mm. just sit connected and really notice what's good around you. I mean, it's, it's not an easy practice if no. you're worried about something, but um, it's certainly saved my butt a number of times. Otherwise, I can be out there strategizing. Yeah, it's so true. I was just thinking about um, election day for me. So uh, elect, we had an election last week. I don't know if you knew, know, knew that or had heard maybe about what was going on. But um, what we tend to do when we are stressed out about something is a lot of us ruminate, right? We just think about the same things over and over again, right? And what we need to do is get off that train. Um, we just need to stop for a little while and let our brain kind of process it on its own speed and then come back to the conversation so that we can do some, if we need to do something about it. So I was in that space in the morning of ruminating and decided to go get some coffee before I went to my office. And I thought, oh, this is not good. Like I'm not, I cannot spend my whole day on this train, right? And so immediately thinking, 
what can I do to shift that? And so part of that was the posture. So there's the gratefulness posture. There's also a generosity posture. So having my husband and I talk about these different postures that we try on and, and then we try to practice when we are starting, we start to get in those places, right? So the generosity posture is, is just what um, Chris said about empathy. Just how do I show someone empathy, right? So I thought, oh, I'm picking up coffee. I could pick up coffee for someone else. I could pay for the person's order behind me, except I couldn't because they had done a mobile order and they totally missed out on my generosity, right? Um, so, you know, but, but there was that sense of like shifting the conversation in my head that needed to happen. Um, and so for, from a lens of faith, for me, it's putting my, taking my eyes off of myself and putting it somewhere else, uh, my, on the divine or on uh, whoever God is called uh, other people to be. Okay, those are some great strategies. Let's look at the next strategy here. Uh, strategy two. I want background music for Zoom. That would make me really happy when I am changing screens. Uh, they have not asked me yet for that. So the strategy two for me is grieve what you are missing. Y'all, we are missing a lot. We are grieving and we are deep in grief and we do not even realize it because we as Americans, oh, we suck at dealing with grief. We just do. We have a hard time naming our grief, allowing ourselves to grieve. We want to just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or we tell other people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, to, to not cry. I mean, you know, you think it's 2020, we might not hear these tropes, but they are here everywhere. So the second strategy is to grieve. The holidays will not be what you're used to. So name it, name it. One night at dinner, my husband um, looked at our family and instead of doing our gratefulness practice, he said, what's something, name one thing you're grieving right now. What's one thing you're missing? You know, and I mean, I, like, I wish I could say it was like this deep conversation where we were all crying cathartically together. No, it wasn't. But it wasn't because we tend to have those kinds of conversations in our family. And so putting it on the table just allows it to be messy. You know, my kids were grieving not having their, their seasons of sports, et cetera. They're grieving not being with their friends in the same way. Uh, they're grieving, just like I'm grieving the fact that the plan that I had for hot the holidays is now kaput because of our current spike, right? You know, like we're grieving, we're sad. Um, and it's okay to be, to, to grieve. In fact, we actually have to grieve and kind of name it. So one of the things I put uh, on here is that there's this um, really interesting um, group called Big Life Journal and they work with um, developing uh, a growth mindset. I don't know if you're familiar with growth mindset. Um, and these are these are more ch uh, cards that are for children, but I, I think they're really great conversation cards. Let's see if it'll come up on the screen. They just have some basic reflection questions that are growth mindset oriented. So it allows you to recognize when things aren't great, but then to move towards uh, a way that that things might be able to shift. So thinking about the same thing, well, how might, how have you been grieving and how might you grieve right now what you're missing this holiday season? So let's think about what are specific ways that you might be able to name your grief. There's a great question in the chat that was sent to me that's, how do you, do you set a time limit or something for grief so that you don't allow it to, to go into depression? Um, and, you know, I, I'm definitely speaking not from a healthcare professional, um, that it's not my background, but um, I do think, yeah, that it is really key and crucial to, to talk about it, to name it. If you're, un, if, if you need some extra help to, to get through it, then, ask for help, you know? Um, I think that's the, for me, that's been so key is recognizing when, okay, like there's grief. And when I'm unable to, when my own coping mechanisms and skills aren't able to, 
to handle it than to be able to say, I need, I need to talk to someone, you know, or I might need some extra help. Um, and that's so key and crucial. There are so many people today. Uh, and I would say probably many of us, I've really been struggling with my own anxiety. I've really had to work on managing my own anxiety during this time. And I've been doing that through uh, therapy, through meds, thank God, through a lot, a lot, a lot of exercise um, and through meditation and prayer. You know, like we all need help at times. And so ask for help. Um, and if you can't get help or need some help with that, I know that there are several people on this call that might be able to, uh, to, to point you in some good directions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to also connect you with people. And if you need resources or other people that you know and love need resources for that, there are resources in our community to make that stuff happen. So ask for help. So I love some of the things that I've seen in the chat, handling grief from Perry. She said that they schedule family Zoom meetings, journaling, and then talking about it with colleagues and friends. Uh, and I love, Lynn, I really appreciated you just putting here, like, I miss having people over. That's a, that's a grief that's there, you know? Um, and Dawn, I'm grieving that my parents cannot leave the nursing facility. Um, it's just, there's so much there. There's so much grief there. <laughs> Autumn, I miss hugs. Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> I'm with you on that, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's grief. That's not the whole story, but it's part of the story. And to hold it, to be present to it, means that we're not held captive to it, hopefully. That's where we would hopefully get to. Holly, I'd, instead of typing mine, I'll just interject really quickly if you don't yeah. mind. No, please. For mine, of course I miss my family, but my family is very, very different from me and takes a very, very, very different approach to mm -hmm. dealing with COVID than I do. Um, so that's been something I've been sort of like I've had to grow up a little bit and realize that my family wasn't the archetype that I've always thought that they mm -hmm. were. Um, and, and deal. So that's, that's a, a flavor of grief and have been really grateful that my insurance company has waived all fees associated with therapy for the year. So mm -hmm. <laughs> loading up on that. And many corporations have done that this year. So if you, if you don't know about that, check out if you have health insurance through your corporation. That's, good. That's a great point, Kyle, too, because I think that there's a way that we have this, uh, this picture of what family looks like on the holidays. That's this Norman Rockwell, but families are really messy, right? And there's, there's, for some of us, there's actually a little bit of relief of like, oh, okay, I don't have to deal with that, you know, or that uncle or that aunt or that fill in the blank, you know, um, or I can take a deep breath and, and have a maybe curate a different type of experience, which really, I think, leads us into the next strategy. So thanks for setting me up there. So our next strategy is, actually two strategies from now, but the next strategy is to translate, to translate. So what I mean by this is to think of one or two or a handful of things that you found helpful that you really like about the holiday and figure out a way to translate them into today. So for me, it's food, right? Like there are certain, there are certain dishes that we always had at different holiday meals growing up. And so for me, having those, making those really helps me. So for example, when I was growing up, I'm the oldest of seven, we would each, each seven of us, all seven of us would make a different side for the meal. So we don't make seven sides at my house now <laughs> because we don't have that many people. But, you know, there's something that was, that's just my kids each take a side and make it or take two, you know? So there's something about, for me, just taking that one tradition and translating it into a, a new space and breathing life into it in a different way. Yeah, there you go. Um, so translation. So I think translation is really important. Translation is not the only thing, though. Um, 
And so I really want us to, to, I want us to start here, but we cannot stop here. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So think about like there's, Denise said music, you know, what, what's a way that you can incorporate the same kind of music or what you've done in the past? Um, what are some things that you're thinking about in terms of watching sports together? I love it. It's possible during, by doing FaceTime. Uh -huh. I'm, uh, I love the jello salads. <laughs> um, there's so many um, people who have been doing, have been cooking on FaceTime or on Zoom together. It's been so fantastic to hear about grandmothers teaching and grandfathers teaching their grandchildren how to cook online. Um, and what, what a beautiful picture that is. Um, and especially for, you know, yeah, it's, it's so neat to see family systems that might not be all together be able to have actually more, some more contact. Holly, I've always had a lot of people come. Like that's mm -hmm. always been my way. And I think, and we're not even doing immediate family together. Like each yeah. individual family is kind of doing their own thing. And I had a big idea on how to do it outside, but they didn't go for it. But what, what I'm finding is the conversation that I get to have with just my kids and their mm. spouses, their significant others. So now we're, rather than doing the great big meal for many, we're talking about doing, my mother was an incredible cook and my grandmother, mm. like really like bon appetit kinds of things wow. and setting the table with all the good silver and the, you know, really yep. making it fancy, sit down, yep. enjoy it. So we're altering what we do. And sometimes it's kind of chaotic the other way. This sounds like it might be a little more peaceful mm. and manageable. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful, I mean, it's, it'll be interesting, I think, on the other side to see what we've gained, um, as well as what we've lost. We, we kind of focus right now on what we've lost, but we've really gained so much. Um, I love Perry just put drive by food exchange to share the meal together in different homes. I think there's so many, it, it's going to be different, you know, uh, I will miss the chaos of my cousins gathering at the lake house um, and all the little cousins running about and there being uh, somebody always ending up in the lake and the turkey being uh, being done on the on the campfire that has the trash the trash can turkey uh, with the the can of uh, beer up its rear so you know like I, I will miss that you know um, and and there's something about sometimes what will I gain about slowing down. Uh, not driving so much, being able to be present. Can anybody else think of one or two things in their own world that they might be able to translate from what they've done in the past to what, yes, not having anything else, uh, what they've done in the past to what we could do this year? Holly, I've thought about, we don't decorate outside the house. I've thought about extending that out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I won't tell Dave until. <laughs> I love that, uh, Elizabeth, that you wrote, you know, you have no family here besides your parents. And there's just that, that opportunity to be family together, that opportunity to be together. Yeah, I think a lot of times um, we kind of feel sorry for ourselves because, um, you know, all these other families have these big gatherings and like, it's just us, like the three of us. And, um, you know, this year it's like, I mean, we're not missing anything because right. those are my quarantine people, but <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, and this kind of leads me to the next strategy is I think that this has the capacity to also expand our own compassion. And the way that I think that it could do that is that not everybody has the opportunity to gather with people in a large group. So trying something new, we might have compassion and, and might be able to say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that somebody else was doing this so differently. Or I didn't realize what it would be like to not have my family of origin around, et cetera. 
uh, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm the oldest of seven and getting all of us together these days is just challenging before COVID, you know? And so, and, and being a pastor means that I don't have Christmas or those other holidays with my significant, with my family of origin. So, you know, there are, there's, this, there's a lot of people out there like that, that just don't have those same family connections in this area. So what might it look like to have compassion for somebody, um, whether that's just offering them kindness, offering them hope and healing, um, or offering a meal or another way of connecting. So strategy number four is try something new. I think one of the challenges is, is sometimes in our culture, we tend to go either full throttle one way or full throttle to the other way. You know, we have this, we like, we like, uh, binaries a lot and binaries are not really helpful i.e look at our uh, political climate uh, that is all i will say about that so binaries um there it's also it's a fallacy like if you look at debate it's a like it's just a basic fallacy that there's only two options and so when we look at this it's not about being a having a perfect holiday or perfect thanksgiving with this image of perfect that that perhaps only you have constructed in your head and it's not also, it's not the other extreme. Well, I give up, I'm not gonna do anything. I don't know if you've heard that yet, but I venture to say we will start to hear more of that. Well, I can't do anything, right? There's actually a lot in the middle. So try something new. You, you have no idea, it might be something that you just love. You know, I, I instituted something at our uh, uh, family camp in our area and did it twice. And the next thing you knew, I heard that it was, uh, it was tradition now, you know, like it was not something, I mean, it just, that's what happens, right? So it, if you don't usually take a hike as a family, take a hike as a family, right? Or if you uh, usually make everything from scratch, get takeout. I mean, what a year, this would be the best year for takeout, right? Like why not, you know, like choose something intentionally different just to shift a little bit. Because it's nice to do, to have the, the, the comforts of doing something that's similar, but sometimes it's just really hard to have the, the memory that it's not going to be the same. And so if we actually just do something intentionally different, then it shifts our perspective and we might be able to see something new. There was this one, one time uh, for, for, uh, for Christmas for our family, because that's the, the holiday in December that, that we tend to celebrate. My family uh, of origin, um, mom, all my siblings were home. We had all seven of us home. My parents were there. We had another friend over. We went to this late night service, came home and put this 1973 album called The Rhodes Family Christmas. And the next thing you know, we're discoing through the living room and we used to open one gift on that the night before Christmas. And we decided just to you know, open all the gifts at two o'clock in the morning. And the next thing you know, someone's making breakfast and none of it was planned. And yet when I look back, that's one of the richest moments I have with my family. So the thing that's hard here is you never know if what you try is going to be that. So you really have to be open to learn and free to fail and just set that expectation. We're going to try this. If no one likes it, we don't have to ever do it again. But if people like it, we could talk about it next time. You know, set the expectation and try something new. Do it. Do an ice cream sundae extravaganza. You know, have a, you know, a mashed potato carving contest. I, I don't. I don't know what it is for your family. Pick a different board game. Um, but try something new. Can you think of a time that in your own world, when when things were not going, this the same way when something had to change, maybe someone was in the hospital or someone got sick, that you had to shift and change. I, I love, Perry just put this here, that they, to make an untraditional meal, that her youngest son is not a fan of holiday food anyway, so we could skip the turkey, stuffing, cranberry sauce, and instead make his favorite meal. What a gift, what a gift. What a gift. My husband is now laughing at me because I said, what a gift, and apparently that is one of my catchphrases. So uh, the last strategy I have on here is hold expectations with open hands. So I, I actually do this physically, right? Because 
I, when I find myself thinking, oh, I really want to do this, you know, oh, I'm so excited about this that's coming up. I want to, like, I, when I turned 40, I wanted to have the best party ever. I wanted to have so much fun. And it just wasn't in the cards for me that year for some reason. So what do I have to do when I'm holding on to something? Is I've just got to open my hands. I've got to change those expectations. Hold, hold the expectation with open hands. We started talking about this a lot this summer because it, it really felt like, you know, and I'm sure this is true for you all too. I felt like every two days I was telling my kids, okay, well that got canceled. Let's do this. Okay. That got canceled. Let's do this. Okay. That got canceled. I'm not going to tell you what I'm planning because I can't deal with this anymore. Right? <laughs> like the expectation trap is huge. So when Jim and I got married, um, our, our friend who did the wedding, he was amazing, uh, said, looked at both of us and said to us, something will go wrong. Something will go wrong. And you know what? The day of my, day of my wedding, I walked down the stairs to my parents' house and I hear my mom say, don't tell Holly, don't tell Holly, right? And I'm all like, oh, great, what happened? You know? And she says, you know, the, the caterer's not there. And I said, oh, okay. That's fine. We can, we can just order pizza if we need to. And at, like I had been prepared, right? I had prepared myself to say, you know, something's going to go wrong. Not in, a, not in a, a sad or a negative way, but just recognizing that this illusion of perfection that we hold up there is just that. It's an illusion. So being able to say, okay, here's my expectation. I want to, I want to get married. But that's what Jack told us before we got married. At the end of the day, you'll be married. You know, something else might go wrong, but you'll be married. I say that to every couple I work with now because something or some things go wrong, right? And knowing at the end of the day, the goal, that's the goal. Not all this other stuff. The other stuff's really nice, but here's the goal. Let's make that happen. So how, do you have any, any ways that for you, you do that, that you're able to take those expectations that you hold really tightly and peel open your hands and hold them loosely so that you can shift better when things change. What's your trick? I like Tasha's being upside down, it's her trick. Yeah, Holly, I think that's really important for us because um, we don't have any family in Evansville. Um, so, you know, when people say that they're getting together with their families and holidays and stuff like that, that's not our life. Yeah. So we're used to um, just it being us two in the house uh, for holidays. So it's kind of interesting watching people now kind of freak out about that concept right. um, when it's been our life for the last 13 years. Uh, so for us, um, it's just really some of the expectations we may have, like if someone's doing a Friendsgiving, um, where it's like afterwards or whatever, we would even hold that as kind of like it may or may not because we understand people have their families and um, things may run over with them. So we've just kind of, instead of being disappointed when things don't work out, we go in with the mindset that they'll try. Yeah. And we just keep it loosely that way. So that way no one gets offended and no hearts are broken. <laughs> yep. It's real wisdom, I think. And I wonder, I do wonder if... That's where some of us who are like in this room um, or people that you know for whom they don't have family here might be able to offer some wisdom to folks in this room who do have family here. You know, there is some shifting that people have already made because of location or because of situational things in life. Might be an interesting way to learn from each other. Yeah, I'm so glad that was said because that's something that I've really thought about a lot this year is like, so many of us are so focused on family, 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 and we have friends who are basically family. And sometimes those friends don't necessarily have the same thing to do as us. Um, and so that's actually like a positive I've kind of saw this year is that a lot of us, like Rita, like you said, you've been doing this, you know, this has been, you know, and a lot of us this year kind of realizing, oh, we have time kind of for everybody. Um, and maybe we've been overly hyper focused on just family at this time of year. So I think it's kind of a positive. I think so too. Denise, 
put some wisdom in the chat too about when you have a reaction to a situation, uh, having to back up and realize you're hold, being, holding on too tightly. Yeah, anytime that I'm reacting instead of responding is my key. I'm like, ooh, I need to take a deep breath and maybe do something else. Oh, thank you, Don. I think that when you end up alone or on a family-oriented day or event, you need to give yourself permission to pamper yourself, do something just for you. Great insight. Well, I wanted to offer just a few strategies that I know that I've found helpful. This notion of, um, of being grateful and starting from that place to go ahead and grieve what we're missing, to, to name those things that are disappointing and hard for us, uh, to translate rituals or uh, things that we've done in the past that are meaningful to our current situation in whatever way works. Uh, to try something new, to really say, let's try something. It might work, it might not. And then to hold our expectations with open hands as a way of us just having a posture of being able to enjoy our holidays, of being able to bring joy to others, and to ultimately live well and live with health during this time that is just so fraught with uh, confusion and stress and a pandemic. Um, so there you go. Holly, I was thinking too, we've been talking about family and personal. Um, I know that, that at LE, we've had to really let go of expectations about how we do retreats. How do we do celebration of leadership? Like there might've been a hope, maybe we can do it in person this year instead of televised, but the reality is, is that we, we are almost in a constant state of pivot or flex mm -hmm. because things keep changing. Um, but for the people that went through the last retreat, their experience was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just simply amazing. And it was, it was the mindset of the way we've done it in the past that made mm -hmm me worried what if it doesn't work the same because we're doing right. it a little different when of course safety was crucial you know all these things so a lot of times i need to check myself if i'm starting to um have an expectation that something's going to be really good and really bad i might just need to say you have no idea what's going to happen yeah um and i keep saying to myself be open be open yeah. be open but you know that's hard because right. i there's times i'm one of my top strengths is strategy so i'm always trying to figure out what might happen next and plan and it's also become kind of a problematic strength at times no. when i can't i've got to be completely open to ambiguity and then be ready to to change so i think i think all of us it's not just in one area of our life, it's in the whole one. And, and I think that's why sometimes we get exhausted or we or I'll get to this thing like, all right, if I can make Christmas freaking Eve and my kids Christmas morning just right, then it doesn't matter that the rest of it was different. And I'm thinking about this, like, what are you doing? I mean, you're setting it up to be a problem and it just, too. It, but it, I really appreciate what you've, what you've said it's helped a lot oh yeah all five these strategies i see them in my in my work right i mean we've been intentionally working on being grateful uh and we've been putting uh question cards on our social media and they're all about gratefulness because it's all about beginning joy um and we've just needed that we've needed to remember oh yeah we, we like each other you know like this is important, what well, the work we do is important, you know? We've, we've had to grieve, just name, there are certain things that we, in traditions we haven't been able to hold to. We've had to take, to figure out what are our values and how do we translate those into today? Mm -hmm. Are there some that we can translate? Because not all of them translate. You can't do Zoom for everything. That is a bad idea, right? And then try something new and help, helping people, not just me, but everyone, set, hold expectations with open hands. So. Yeah, I really like that. It's good. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you all today.
really terrific, Holly. People saying so many lovely things in the chat. So thank you for bringing up some real important information to us. And thank you all for, for coming. And then we'll send this out to people that were unable to attend so that they can also have the same um, experience, hopefully, to, to be able to get to learn the same kinds of things. And I'm going to encourage all of us to maybe reach out to a couple of the people you've seen on this and just keep checking in. Find out how people are doing. And um, I, I think it, it just seems like that always helps a great deal for both people. So anyway, you're a great bunch. Really great. Anything else, Denise, do we have? No, um, don't forget to nominate for Celebration of Leadership, everybody. It's already November, people. Yep. We gotta do this. Deadline is mid-December. Mm -hmm. And get on there and do voice and send it out to your friends. Yeah. Holly, thank you so much. Thanks, Wonderful. Wonderful. You. Peace to you. you. Bye. You. you make a difference. Bye, friends. Peace.